morning, Southside Bible Church, and welcome to anyone here is here with the conference. Uh, we've been doing a missions conference uh, Friday, Saturday, and this morning, and we have been greatly blessed and encouraged and exhorted. It's been an excellent time together. If you need to, I think those are going to be online if you'd like to, um, to see what all God has been teaching us. I think it's important as the whole body to understand our call uh, before God as a church. Um, during our worship service today, uh, we will conclude our conference by looking at Luke 24. If you'll turn there, Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53. I'd like to read that passage and then we will pray. Now Jesus said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my father upon you but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these parting words of Jesus Christ, the commission that he left for his bride. And so I pray, Lord, based on the one giving it, the work that was performed on our behalf, God, may we give heart, mind, soul, and strength to serve the King of Kings. May we be done with lesser things. Lord, would we give our lives to this one, Jesus Christ, to be his hands and his feet and his mouth to take this gospel to our, our neighbors, to our cities, and to the nations. God, let every heart understand this commission. God, let every uh, feet and hands be swift to move. Lord, work in our midst. Let us Finish now with great worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, these are Luke's last rec recorded words for us during Jesus' earthly ministry. And so in these, the work of redemption is finished. Jesus came and he did what he said he would do and he accomplished salvation. And now he's going to give these words to his followers they are his commission to the church until he returns. And so it is our commission this morning to every blood-bought believer on the face of the earth this morning, this is our commission. These orders are to make sure that we don't miss why we exist, that we just don't drift into sentimentalism in the church or just even moralism, activism, an academic center. Christ will leave very clear instructions for his bride so we don't drift. And so this morning, we'll come face to face with the risen Christ telling us what is to preoccupy us while we sojourn to glory. What's to be our response to the risen Christ and the ascended Christ? What are we to be about? And I pray that the Spirit would give us all ears to hear what he says to the church this morning. Christ told a parable earlier in Luke. He said, a wise and sensible steward he put in charge of his vineyard. And he said, blessed is the servant who will be found faithful when he returns. And here's the vineyard that he's put us in charge of this morning, the world. And we're to take this message to the nations. This is to be our preoccupation. We are to tell the world to repent and to receive the forgiveness of of their sins. There are a million things trying to distract us from fulfilling this command, like religious things and nice things and moral little things. There's a veil that is made up of a million sparkling things in this world to distract us from it. And the ascension this morning is to lift that veil to see Jesus as the greatest thing for why history exists, why you exist and to give your life to take his salvation to all you can while you have your being. And my prayer is that veils would be lifted this morning. A flesh that's grown over, believing hearts that he would cut that off. 
that we'd have 2020 vision on the glory and the plan of our God and our participating in his ingathering of the nations and not get short-sighted on the American dream but to dream Jacob's dream. And so we're going to use the word of God to do that and we're going to do it from Luke 24. And so I want to look at this outline this morning. We're going to look at seven aspects of the Great Commission in Luke 23 through 49. Uh, we're going to look at this commission as biblical. It's to be understood. It's historical. It's redeeming. It's Christological. It's personal and it's supernatural. And I'm praying that all of these pieces will stir our hearts in fulfilling the Great Commission. So if you'll Come with me. Luke 24 will begin. It's biblical in verse 44. Now Jesus said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and of the prophets and the Psalms, the whole Old Testament, must be fulfilled. We, 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 we must start uh, in Jerusalem in verse 44. In Acts 1.8 was read, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the remotest parts of the earth. The problem is the Jews didn't believe that Jesus was Messiah. He was killed by the leaders of the people. And so their problem was a lack of understanding the Scriptures, what we call our Old Testament. They didn't get it. And what did Christ teach the men on the road to Emmaus just in a few earlier verses? It said, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he showed their fulfillment was to be in him. They all pointed to him. In particular, it pointed to his death and his resurrection, which are to be the pillars of the message that we take. And so Jesus is the Messiah, and he's the fulfillment of God's plan. And he, he is what was promised and what was prophesied of through the whole Bible. And he tells them that in verse 44. This has all been pointing to me, and this has been told to them often. So all had to be fulfilled. And you have to get this then to be faithful to the Great Commission. It's more than just telling people you need to get Jesus. You need to invite him into your heart. You need him to be the captain of your ship or to get your number. When we take up this gospel, we're to preach that this message is not some intrusion into history. It's why history exists. It's not a late religion made up. This didn't pop up out of nowhere. It started in the beginning in Genesis 1-1 when God created and it goes to the very end of history when Christ will be put on display forever. And so our evangelism is scripture evangelism. We're to show the world this is what scriptures have taught. This is God's plan. You don't understand your own scriptures is what Jesus is saying to the Jews. You search them and you, you, you miss that they point to me. The whole book of Hebrews was amazing to show the fulfillment of all of Judaism in this beautiful one, Jesus Christ. And so we see that from the seed of Abraham, all the nations will be blessed. Here's the seed. Genesis 49, he'll come from the line of David. 2 Samuel 7, he'll be born of a virgin. Micah 5, 2, he'll be born in Bethlehem and his going forwards are from everlasting. He's going to be betrayed by a familiar friend, Judas. He's going to be beaten, spit upon. His beard is going to be plucked out. They're going to gamble for his garments. Zechariah 12 says he'll be pierced through for our transgressions. Isaiah 53, his, his death will be a sacrifice, vicarious, taking our death. He'll rise from the dead. Jesus did not invent himself, nor did the first century. And so we must get at the foundation of our mandate. Guys, this is the plan of God. This is what history exists for. This is the fulfillment of all of redemptive history. And you preach the scriptures that point to Jesus Christ. Philip says, beginning with the scriptures, he preached Jesus. Acts 17, Paul went into the Jewish synagogue and he reasoned with them from the scriptures. So don't miss our mandate. We must be growing in our ability to preach Jesus Christ from the scriptures. 
If you want to fulfill the Great Commission, we, we need to see Jesus in this Bible and proclaim him and share him with all. Second, and my COVID brain is bad, and we had a beautiful testimony I just realized that we were supposed to do before I started preaching. So I'm going to finish, and you're going to hear a beautiful testimony uh, at the end of this sermon, and it probably is going to work out better that way because what she has to share is the Great Commission, and it's going to live out, and then you're, you're just going to love the beauty of what you're going to hear. So apologize for changing the flow. It's my life story. It's my spiritual gift. <clears throat> you got it? You have it too? <laughs> okay, verse 45, then this this commission must be understood. This, is, this point is unbelievable. Verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So I'm the fulfillment of all the scriptures, and now he opens their minds to understand what they are, what they mean, what they teach. They teach Christ. And I think this is so important to understanding our great commission. Christ is a revealer. He's a prophet in the truest sense of the word. Today, Christianity has become a set of beliefs that you just take up. It's the opposite of how the Bible explains it. It, it is something that kind of comes upon you. you. You don't take it up. It takes you up. You don't make a choice. It's a response to something that is just seeking you out always. I love testimonies because all they are is that God hunted you and sought you out. And, and when you were a stranger, he brought you into the fold of God. That is every true testimony. So what is it that comes after you? It's Jesus Christ, the revealer. And I love it. He is not a passive savior. Luke 15, he seeks out the lost and he brings them home. He's a shepherd that will break legs and put lambs on his shoulders and bring them home. So in our text, Jesus comes to his disciples and he opens their minds to understand the scriptures. And let me just read to you Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, one of Jesus' sweet prayers. He said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou did hide these things from the wise and the intelligent, and he revealed them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in thy sight. All things have been handed over to me, Jesus, by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. Christ is a revealer. I come to you. And you get it, and you realize he's the only way, the truth, and the life. He's a revealer. And I want you to hear this. Christianity comes and gets you. If you're here this morning, be careful. He comes after you. And he hunts you down, and he's the revealer of the hidden and beautiful glory of Jesus Christ. So what does he do? 2 Corinthians 4, 3. This is uh, Nick Decker. I'm glad you're here. You preached on this. Your, one of your first sermons here. I've been preaching to my son Taylor since he was born, and after that sermon, he goes, that's the best sermon I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> so, now I see why lions eat their young. <laughs> <clears throat> that's bad. Jesus became a human being, and he walked this earth, and he taught us, and it was an external word, and it was put on paper and recorded parchment it's truth. And now his heavenly ministry, we'll see at the end of this sermon, he's ascended and there's a great commission. And he teaches now through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and he opens our minds to the truth. Man, 2 Corinthians 4.3, even if our gospel's veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelieving that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who's the image of God. The devil's blinded their minds. They can't see beauty in Jesus. They see more beauty in this world, their own identity, their own glory. They can't see it. In verse 6, God said, light shall shine out of darkness, and he's the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. He says, let there be light, 
and you see how lovely Christ is and you're willing to take up your cross and die, deny yourself and follow after him. He shows you his beauty and his glory and what he's done. He illumines the word that we might understand the external word. So he spoke external word and we have it in our Bible and the spirit speaks it into our internal heart that we might believe. Verse 45, he opened their eyes to see. That's the internal word. On the road to Emmaus, when he's sharing with them, the, the, the men said, uh, were not our hearts burning within us when he showed us himself from the scriptures? That's the internal, were not our hearts burning within when I heard this gospel and saw the glory of Christ. That's the glory of the great commission that Jesus can give light for eyes to see all over the world. That's why I go, because he's a revealer. He's a prophet. So we need the external word preached, proclaimed, and I need the Holy Spirit to preach the internal word to hearts and souls and reveal Jesus Christ and remove that veil. Without this, why would you travel the world with this message? There's no hope without that. With this, this should enliven hearts to say, I go. Throughout the Old Testament, we saw these great human prophets bringing the truth, but all they could do was bring the external word of God and mostly they're rejected. So we're promised there's a better prophet than Moses now under the new covenant. One who could come and open minds to understand the scriptures concerning himself. We don't just need a counselor. We need the wonderful counselor, mighty God, the Prince of Peace. And he says, I'll be with you until the end. I'll be with you and I'll be revealing. And so this prophet takes the external word and he brings it internal. He gives us light. He gives us eyes to see. No other prophet could do this. No evangelist could do this. But Christ, Paul was a human prophet only. And he said in Ephesians 1.18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be open to get this. We have, a pl we have plenty of religions and leaders with external word. Try your best. Every world religion, go do your best. Clean up. Do better. Or there's other religions, they're just mystical. Just get in touch with your inner self. They're, they're all internal. None have a redeemer who's a prophet. A man who is God and a God who is man who reveals this gospel to our hearts and opens our eyes to understand the scriptures. Why does he have to do this? Well, verse 45, we're spiritually blind. And, the, and I love this word. And it says he opened their minds. And there's two Greek words for open. One is anoigo, and it means to open a door. A door. Then there's one called dia anoigo, which means to break open, to bust open, or to break in. And which one do you think Jesus chose? They had dia anoigo. The human door of the heart and the mind have layers and layers and obstacles of unbelief, struggles, sin, wrong desires. They're blind. And the human soul has been made with a transparency. We were made in the image of God to have capacity for personal connection with God. And, and sin is the cataracts of your soul and you, you can't see and you can rub your eyes all you want and, and you can't get rid of a cataract. You need a surgeon. You, don't, you just don't need someone to inform you. You need a surgeon to open your eyes. And Jesus can remove that veil. He can remove spiritual cataracts so that this morning you can see him in all of his glory. So understand this. You can intellectually understand the word of God. Some of you are sitting in our midst this morning. I've always believed the gospel since I was one. And you have an inability to value the truth. To value means to appreciate something and it gains value and it, and it increases with your realization of it. So I want you to get this. In your natural state, you need a dia noigo. You need someone to break open the door and rip it open and shine light into your darkness this morning. 
You need Jesus to break open the door to your mind so that you can see the value of Jesus Christ and you can say, I count all things lost compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I might gain Christ. That's what happens when he opens this up. How does he do it? Well, he says so that they could understand the scriptures. The idea here, it's an interesting Greek word, carries the idea to assemble a puzzle. I don't like puzzles. And I just want you to picture 100 pieces on a table. This is why I don't like them. I just look at them and I see nothing. And I, I could look for hours and everyone else is putting pieces in and I'm just sitting there looking and I never put a piece in. But when, I, when it's assembled, wow, I see. It's the exact same content as it was before it was assembled. But once together, you can see every connection and all of its beauty. And many in the church have all the pieces of the puzzle. You got all these doctrines and all, all these things everywhere, but we've never seen the connection. When you finally say, even my sins are forgiven. It's not just a bunch of doctrines. Jesus died for my sins. They're forgiven. They're separated as far as the east is from the west. Adia noiga. He breaks it open and now you see the glory of Christ. In this gospel, this is the glory that we take the Great Commission with. I get this. My heart burns within me. And Jesus will do this for other people. He's a prophet. He's a revealer of himself. It's amazing to me who comes to believe this is usually the most unlikely people. And so I, I enter into this commission because Jesus is a revealer. And he opens the mind to understand the truth. So this commission, it's biblical. It's to be understood. You can't go do the commission till you can say, even my sins. And so it starts with a personal gospel. And then I have come to see this. And third, it's historical. If you look at me in verse 46, and he said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. Jesus told them again and again this would happen throughout the uh, Gospels. That the Christ would suffer. We're going to look at Sunday school for the next seven weeks, the seven sayings of Jesus on the cross. Oh, did he suffer? He'll rise again on the third day, and on the third day some women came to the grave and he was gone. And the angel said he was raised just as he was said. And so I want you to understand this this morning. This is historical. This is exactly how God said he would redeem a race unto himself. This is exactly what happened in history. The message that we take to this world, just hear this. It happened in this world. Simple point. Some of you act like it didn't happen in this world. It's history. God entered into the world he made and he died on a cross to save people for himself. We have a historical Christ who hung on a cross on Calvary's tree. We have a world that went dark for three hours. We have a Christ taking his last breath going, Te telestai, it's finished. It's done in history. In history, it's been accomplished as a human. As taken on flesh and blood, it's done. So we don't take an allegory to the world. I don't take a dream. I don't take a made-up story. I take the historical plan of God, the literal Christ crucified to this world to offer, I want you to hear this, a literal forgiveness of your sins. Do you hear that? Every sin, though it was scarlet, will be made as white as snow. And my favorite verse, I will remember your sins no more. That is what will literally be forgiven because a literal historical Christ died on that cross bearing the wrath of God in my place. So it's biblical. It's understood. It happened in history. And if you'll look now with me in verse 47, it's redeeming. And that repentance 
for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. I can't believe the message that we preach, the truth that we proclaim. We go into a world that is sick and dying because of sin, because of sin, because it treasured its own glory instead of God's. And so the greatest need of our world is not education. We have educated sinners. It's not government. It's not a new policy. It's not moralism. Just say no to drugs and just say no to sex. It's not science. It's not, we, it's not terrorism. It's not to get out of this recession. It's not a cure for the markets and our housing. The great need of this world is they're just lost in sin, dying. Sin separates from what you were made for, God, and we die when we move away from God. We disintegrate. We don't evolve. We devolve. Sin is the root of all of our problems. It's why this morning we're anxious. It's why we're angry. It's why we're lustful. It's why we're greedy. Sin is the problem of this world, and sin has separated you from God. And the Word of God tells us that the soul that sins must die and that the wages of sin is death. Brethren, the God of the universe has told us what our problem is, and it's sin. And it has separated you from God. And you must see this this morning as your greatest problem. You might have walked in and said, my greatest problem is my finances. And I don't want you to leave till you know your greatest problem is your sin. And I need you to see sin. We sin, you know why? Because we're sinners by nature, by our very core. It's a stain and a reality that no man can remedy. Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin or a leopard his spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. God looked out in Genesis 6 and said, all he saw was the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In the Hebrew, that's before you even form a thought, it's already bent and crooked and twisted. That's our problem. That's your problem. That's my problem. Sin, the forgotten word in the church of God. We're so messed up because of it, we can't find our way back to health. We can't find our way back to God. We're like sheep that have gone astray. There, there's none who seek for God. We're broken and we're unfixable by anything human. And we have been given a message to take to a sin-sick world and give it what it needs we, we take the only salve that can fix this world's problem. We take Jesus Christ crucified for sinners and offer that Jesus what he gave to every sinner who came to him for help. Every sinner, he gave him forgiveness of sins. The harlot washing his feet, and he says, though your sins were as many, they're They're They're, they're forgiven. The paralytic, take up your mat, your sins have been forgiven. He gives a, a full pardon to all who will repent. Repent is to change your thinking about God and life and to turn to him. To live now for a reconciled God, to quit living for yourself and your own glory, but for God's. He offers the greatest news for the greatest of sinners. Your sins, though they are many, his mercy is more. Amen? Amen? He gives you what your soul is crying for, a love relationship with God, because your sins are forgiven. What do you want, Martin? What do you want? I want a God I can love and who loves me. That's what I offer to you this morning. A God who loves you, and you can be loved by him, and he can love you. That's what this gospel does. What a Savior, what a message that I take to this world. I never tire of sharing this message and watching it break upon a heart. It's better than Fort Knox when someone gets this. This, God, this commission is biblical. It's understood. It's historical. It happened in time and space. It's redemptive, forgiveness of sins, and it's Christological said, you'll go and be, um, for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name. 
He is the one that the law and the prophets and the Psalms speak of. He's the theme of our song and he's the heart of our message. I love how Peter ended this morning. He gets the glory for everything that we do in missions. I have people make fun of me all the time. Do you talk about anything but Jesus? And my answer is only when I'm drifting. (laughs) He is the answer for everything. He is the yay and amen, isn't he? Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. To have your sins forgiven. The Great Commission is Christological. It is him that we proclaim. I've resolved to know nothing among you except Christ and him crucified. John MacArthur said he's worried about the next generation because they're so quick to run after new things. I got nothing new. I got the old paths of the one who carried a cross up Calvary's tree in my place. We preach Christ. You'll never fulfill the Great Commission if Jesus isn't your message. And so we offer salvation to the world for their sins. It's personal. Verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses of these things. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? I told you this before. I had a young man one time sitting at lunch, and he'd left the faith, and he was now an atheist or agnostic. I don't remember, but he was a genius of a kid, and he was trying to show me scientifically why you can't believe in Christianity, and I'm trying to follow his arguments and go there, and I just said, I'm sorry, buddy. I I met him. I know him. I was there and he put the ring on my finger. I commune with him daily. I know Christ. Your your, your arguments are not working. He's my life. I found forgiveness of sins in his name. My chains fell off. My heart was free. It's personal. I hope that you can say even my sins. I take a Jesus that I'm a witness of his resurrection power, that he can and he does forgive sins to everyone who calls upon his name. He can make the foulest clean, even my sins. This has got to be personal. The Great Commission is not a call to take Christ to a world that you have never seen or met. It's not a good idea that you're preaching. It's the Christ that you have laid hold of, and I know him. Take that to the nations. Take that into your home. Take that into your marriage, your job, your neighborhood, or your schools. I know Christ, and my sins have been forgiven. That's my commission. And then what Peter spoke on this morning is number seven. It's supernatural. I I love this point because my question is, who can do this? Who can take this message into a world that hates Jesus Christ and the one who's preaching it? Well, I I would answer that no one, except verse 49. And behold, I'm sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you're to stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Here's your commission, and you go and you wait until the Spirit is sent. And now you're going to have the power of God to go fulfill this commission. We've talked about it. Jesus said, it's better that I go away. And you're always like, how can it be better to have Christ gone? Well, because now Christ dwells in my heart by the Holy Spirit. So I now go to fulfill this commission and the power of the Holy Spirit and power from on high. I was so afraid to share the gospel. And when when he did a dianoigo and broke that door open and started uh, growing in these trees, there's just no fear with the Holy Spirit going and proclaiming this message and entering into places that before you would never have done. Wait. And in Acts 2, it comes, the Holy Spirit. And they begin preaching Jesus with a power that is from God. And the results were from God where thousands start getting saved right there. They went to the Jews who were struck in their hearts with what they had done. You crucified Christ. 
Peter just pressed it deep and told them, you crucified the Lord of glory. And they cried out, what must we do to be saved? Repent and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Get forgiveness of sins. And they're just getting saved left and right. That's the message that we take. It's the power of God that we go in. I'll be with you always. And, and he can take people who are weak, who are lame in speech, who, who, who are afraid of the world. He can, he can use weakness. In fact, he delights to use weakness because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Let this promise, let this reality cause you to do things that you would never try or say in your natural strength. And so the question this morning, what do I do? We've been here, we've been doing this every year. And I just think it's time to just stop. And we, we have shown you that this is the commission that Christ has given We've shown it's because of the glory of Christ and all of his beauty that he, he was rich and he became poor so that we might become rich. We've shown you that it's by day to day doing what the church is supposed to do and being faithful in and committing to one another and all the things that the church does. We've looked at discipleship and giving our lives to one another and Peter brought us in to just see the glory of being a church that spreads out and gives safe harbor for sinners and for missionaries. And so we've looked at the beauty of all of these things. And from my experience of being a pastor is you can hear these things, you know, week in and week out and never become a doer of the word. And so I think we've shown you gospel motives. And the question is, are we going to just keep continuing living for my kingdom and my agenda and me? Or are we going to finally start taking the steps to give ourselves to this commission together? And so that's my, my prayer, is that we, we finally say, yes, Lord, I'm, I'm going to give my life to this. And some of you need to go across the world, and some of you need to go across the street. But whatever it is, we, we need to be faithful. And I have the, the message, the power of God, for salvation. And so I have a great commission that is biblical. He ripped open my door and I understand it. It's historical. He died on Calvary's hill. And it's redemptive because I have the forgiveness of my sins. And it's Christological. I get to proclaim Christ to this world and it's very personal. Even my sins were forgiven and I have the Holy Spirit of God and His power to go to do what he's calling us to do. So have you become content with not engaging this world? Do we like learning the gospel but not telling it? Are we more concerned about sharing our conscience issues than to have our consciences bound to tell of his wonders? I can't find anything in scripture that calls us to be holy so that we have no contact with a sinful world. The closest thing I can find is the Pharisees. And that is how they viewed sinners. And Jesus cared for them and he engaged them. And he's now handing us a bloody mantle and saying, take this and go tell of the forgiveness of sins through my work on the cross. And so I, I don't know what to do with this. I just know we need to, to let it sting and we need to get along with God and his word and ask him to search our hearts on this issue. And some of us need a world and life view check. We need to not just go with the flow and ask the really hard questions of this commission. That is what you do with a resurrected Christ. And if you'll look with me in Luke 24, 50. Luke, rec Luke records this both times he gives the commission. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, praising God. Amen? 
John Flavel, a Puritan, said this about that. He said, the last sight they had of him in this world was a most sweet and encouraging one. They heard nothing from his lips but love. They saw nothing in him but love until he mounted his chariot and was taken out of their sight. By this, we may be satisfied that Christ carried a heart full of love to his people away with him to heaven. And since his love so abounded in the last act that he ever did in this world, he left such a demonstration of his tenderness with them at parting that they would never forget it as they took this gospel to the world. So I'm gone, but my heart is with you. And he left them so well. And victory, understanding the redemptive history, the fulfillment of all things in him, the message to be preached, his power, his presence, his love and affection for them in a world that would hate him. And he gave us everything that we need for a life of faithfulness for the Great Commission. What a comfort. To God be the glory. Let's pray. Father, I come before you and I thank you for this commission. I thank you for our conference. I thank you for the great things that you taught me and the things that you are working in my own heart. And I pray for all of us, Lord, that you would keep purifying and causing this great unity to work together to, to make much of Jesus Christ. God, let there be no low rangers. Let us be unified in Christ and give our life, mind, soul, our all to him and to him alone. I thank you for the beauties of Christ. Amen.